Knowledge is power. And this is powerful stuff. Wellness Education Cannabis Advocates of Nevada present the Week at 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with your host, Jen Solis. For the next 60 minutes, we'll take an in-depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation. The phone lines are open at 731-1230. That's 731-1230 or toll free. Toll free. 1-866-820-5528. That's 1-866-820-KLAV. Now, let's bring on the host. Here is Jen Solis. Hello, everybody. This is Jennifer Solis. And to my right is Raymond Fletcher and William B.J. Beach Baker. All right. For the next hour, we'll be covering all the stories from Las Vegas, Nevada, and the region. Uh, well, first off, there exciting were... Exciting news. Exciting news. Well, we have. Are you going to talk about that first? Oh, well, what They're are you right going to talk about? The envelope. Oh, we, the, we, we have two Hemp Fest early, tickets so. to give away, so uh, keep listening for your chance to call in and win. Um, first off, we'll cover who turned in their applications to state today. Well, that's where we're going to start off is with the state. Today is an astoundingly, astoundingly historical day. Yes, it is. The state is beginning to accept applications for medical marijuana establishments from today through August 18th. If you have not yet got your application, you can go to health.nv.gov slash medicalmarijuana.html. Applications must be submitted with a $5,000 non-refundable fee. So no applications have been submitted on the first day, and, and if it falls true to form, they'll all be turned in in the last, what, two, three days, something like that? The, the, at, at the, literally the last minute. Literally at the last minute. But they have to be mailed in, um, and not. I don't, I don't see how many are going to be hand-delivered. I don't know, unless they're in the Carson City area, and they're just that, uh, dedicated to their application process. But applicants are eligible to apply to the state to be ranked whether or not they have local government approval. So th this is awesome, you guys. If you did not get approved in county and you would like to apply anyway, the state is encouraging everybody to apply to them. And then, Highly <laughs> and encouraging. Then, and then everything going to go down, uh, down to the local governments. North Las Vegas, it kind of is doing it backwards in a way in, in which that you submit your state application uh, first. The no, only thing they're doing it the right way, not backwards, the well, right way. Well, I was going to say they're just getting zoning approval. They're doing it the way that the law was written and the way the process was intended to be done. Okay, Raymond, I stand corrected. But um, so basically, you have to have a meeting with North Las Vegas to get your zoning um, to get your zoning correct and your zoning approval, and then you uh, submit your application to state, and uh, then you submit your application to North Las Vegas. Correct. Once you get the state approval. Correct. And so there's a mad dash going on right now for land in North Las Vegas. Um, the apex region went from seventy thousand dollars an acre up to eighty five thousand dollars an acre once they announced that With no roads or infrastructure or anything like that that's ridiculous once they announced that apex you didn't need the zoning and it was just to submit for approval uh apex land jumped about fifteen thousand dollars an acre um talk about gouging huh exactly you know taking advantage of the patient's need because you're passing the cost on to the builder, the distributor, who there in turn pass the cost on to the patients. Yeah, for sure. So we um, have a complete list of all medical marijuana applicants. Um, it was it from was, the city of Las Vegas. You got to specify because we're from the city of Las Vegas. Le let me finish up with state because we're oh, doing okay. a little bouncing around here. Well, you know that's how I do. I'm kidding. right. Well, we don't we don't want to confuse our listeners, especially with this being the historic day that you know Nevada patients have waited what 13 years to finally have this process beginning. Uh, yes, and you know, and it's to and it's just a mixed. It's kind of a mixed bag. Some people are just really upset that they 
uh, fear mongers are out there basically saying that our right to grow is going to be taken away from us. Our right to grow is going to be taken no, away from us. No, it's not. No, it's not. Quit being a fear monger. Now pay attention to the law. Be involved in your community. That is your responsibility as a citizen, regardless of what the issue is. That is the truth. You are a stakeholder in this community. You know, you all, you hear all these government meetings, you know, oh, we're going to bring the stakeholder to the table. We're going to bring the stakeholder. You and a citizen, as a resident, as a taxpayer of this great city and state, you are the stakeholder, and it's incumbent upon you to get off your derriere and go to the meetings or read the information online, or I don't know. I'm I'm a little frustrated because I've, I've been hearing Why? people complaining about, oh, I can't do this, I can't do that, and you've seen all this rain that we've had, and I'm out riding my wheelchair in the rain, jumping bus to bus, sitting there when it's 110 degrees out, sun shining on me, hot as all Hades, and the bus doesn't show up, and then you guys, oh, I can't do this, oh, I don't know what's going on. Well, get off your derriere and get involved. Well, yeah, I think it takes a concerted effort to be ignorant and to close your eyes to everything that's going on around you. Um, and so he, Raymond's right. You know, instead of being fear monger and instead of trying to trying to, you know, instill your beliefs on other people, why don't you check out the truth and then and then together we can do it and we can make changes that are positive if indeed they are, you know, facts. Um, if if what the, what the law states is that anybody that cannot afford their medication can continue to grow. Now, now let's do mean, a little math. Let's no, do a math, Raymond. Now, now we're math talking lesson. about the those that are on fixed income, those that may be you know on on a disability, on 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 a straight up income. Then that's not going to a lot any extra money. We're not talking about people that work three, four, five jobs and get paid under the table. Mm. Well, you know, if they get paid under the table, then they can still show that they're low income, right? So, but That's why I use my example. <laughs> okay. Well, the, the fact of the matter is, is let's do a little math. Uh, the state says that you can have two and a half ounces every 14 days. So at two and a half ounces every 14 days, that's five ounces a month. The going price for an ounce in a dispensary um, would be about what? What do you guys think? About four hundred a month? Uh, about four hundred, starting out once dispensaries get going. So four hundred times five is two thousand dollars a month. Can you afford two thousand dollars a month just for medication? No. no. So if you can't afford the $2,000 a month for medication, unless you make, so that's $24,000 a year. Yeah. And so unless you make, unless you make what, $200,000, $250,000 a year, you are still, you're still eligible to grow your own. I don't know. I only make like uh, under twenty thousand a year, so that two hundred is a gold mine to me. <laughs> oh my goodness! Okay, well, you know what? I'm coming home with you. Okay, okay. Let 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 let, let me finish up. Okay, those seeking to operate medical di marijuana dispensaries, cultivation facilities, independent testing labs, or those wishing to uh, produce edible marijuana products must go through the application process, whether they have received local government approval or not. It's in there twice. So I okay. think that's a very important point because we were talking about the inaccuracies of the county process. Now, the good thing is um, the state agency, they're going to post the applications received each day at 3 p.m. And the final numbers will be posted on August 19th. And that's about, you know, it's got, they got a few things that you must do that are different, like property owners must declare a form that that's what they're used for. Mm -hmm. You got to make sure there are no biases as applications are reviewed, you know, and... Like your mama isn't on city council? Exactly. Or your mama ain't the mayor? Exactly. So it's two weeks until August 19th, folks, and so if you don't have any land yet, there's... That's a big scramble, and this, I think North Las Vegas is about the only other one you can get in beside, uh, in the southern region besides Mesquite. 
And we have some news from Mesquite. Remember last time we were saying that Mesquite's uh, meeting was like, um, Mesquite's meeting was like at 6 p.m. following our show. So last Tuesday at 6 p.m., Mesquite's city council met. And what did they have to say, Raymond? Well, the residents, as like with all the other meetings, they turned out in large numbers and they sounded off on the possibility of uh, allowing it. And the mayor took the time to clarify that under state law, Mesquite can only have one dispensary. And he said whatever his city residents decide, he's prepared to enforce that ordinance. So did they say what the large numbers were the pro or they con or they just said large numbers? They just out? said large numbers. They didn't indicate if they were for or against the topic. You know, that that's one of the rural um, papers that shared that with us. Oh, okay. Um, so, Mesquite, Mesquite is, the mayor is for dispensaries uh, being in Mesquite, Mesquite, just one. And, of course, they can have grows up there. And if anybody's ever been up to Mesquite, there is uh, quite the agricultural um, uh, area there with the Virgin River going through. Uh, mesquite there's a lot of uh there's a lot of silt and and a lot of rich land in mesquite um i don't know uh that they're going to be prepared for any outdoor grows of course but still it's there so do we have any more news any local news look out rocky mountain high <laughs> here it comes swinging las vegas Sin City is one step closer to cashing in on cannabis. We just mentioned with the state opening up their application process. Now the biggest tourist attraction, already the biggest tourist attraction in the world, with 39 million visitors per year, the medical marijuana industry in Nevada is proposed to take off. And we are one of, if not, the only state that allows reciprocity. Now, Oregon, Oregon, Oregon does is re well. Oregon is really liberal. You can walk up there and say, "This is my card," and somebody signs off on it. So, Oregon is super liberal about uh, reciprocity. But we're the only one that actually has reciprocity written into our law. That means out-of-state tourists who have a MMJ card can buy cannabis products in Nevada. Tourists without a card can't even apply for one. Uh, this eliminates motivation for patients to sneak their medication through the airport, security, or state checkpoints. Um, and with a petition of circulating uh, that has, is, needs 100,000 signatures, pro-marijuana activists hope to let, uh, legalize recreational use in Las Vegas during the 2016 election. Um, last night on Twitter, Tick uh, Seagerbloom was saying, oh, 110,000 people have their cards in in Colorado, 6,000 in Nevada. That's room to grow. Well, I answered him back. You build it, Tick, and they will come. And you're absolutely right. Once these dispensaries finally do get up and going, you know, the number of people coming out of the shadows, the stigma of, of the negativity that cannabis has on people. You know, it's it's still shocking to be the number the number of um, elderly the, um, people that are my grandma's age that come up to me and talk about you know hearing and seeing about it and wanting more information. So hopefully, that's hilarious because last night Kurt took the dogs to the dog park, and there was a lady at the dog park, and they, he said they were having a great conversation, and he mentioned. She asked, oh, what do you do for a living? And he mentioned, you know, that he is an activist and that he uh, works for We Can and that he also, you know, has a, um, a, a direct marketing type of business for uh, medical marijuana. And she stood up and walked away without even looking back, stood up and just walked away out of the conversation, didn't say not even one more word to him. Uh, she was from Georgia. And, uh, and he was just kind of tickled actually and, and and a little bit a little bit bewildered of why she would just stand up and just walk away from him but i guess you know to some people it is it is a very uh, forbidden subject and um, that, that that poor georgia bell <laughs> she just didn't know but you see what she doesn't know is that the boomers stand to benefit the most from That's cannabis the truth. 
Baby boomers are the group that stand to benefit most from medical marijuana, and their numbers may be key to whether Amendment 2 passes or fails in the state of Florida this year. In addition, industry experts say boomers 50 and older will likely drive growth of medical marijuana revenue. The latest poll released Monday by Connecticut-based Quinnipiac University shows an average 88% of Floridians are in favor of legalizing medical cannabis. And that'll be on election uh, this November. Look, you got Florida, you got three other states. I mean... Yeah, Florida, God's little waiting room, huh? You, you've got to figure that most of that population, over half of that population is over 50 uh, you mm -hmm. know, in certain areas, there, there, it tends to be it tends to be a mecca for a, a lot of older folks um, have vacation homes, you know, in Florida. So, hopefully, some of these people in Florida can get some relief from medical marijuana. You know, I'm just hopeful that our decision makers would finally just open the eyes and see the light. Coming to the light, Caroline. <laughs> oh, exactly. I mean, I think what the, one of the major concerns uh, in Washington is is that the next president, unless this president just uh, and, and, uh, declassifies it or, cl or classifies it as a class two, three, or four controlled substance, that the next president that comes along can just basically, you know, start the the raids and the drug war and everything all up again. Um, and that seems to be a concern with many people. They were saying, you know, there's, there's, you know, Brad Jervik for one, the, uh, the city attorney for Las Vegas was stating that very fact that the, it's the reason that he didn't want to participate. Uh, way back a couple months ago, we were talking about this where he said he didn't want to participate, but then he allowed nobody else to participate either in help crafting the law for city. Well, they got him all straightened out, but, but many people still have that antiquated idea uh, you know. Mayor Carolyn Goodman. Yeah. Great yeah. example. I mean, here you, here's one person with a family member that uses cannabis, and but on one hand, and on the other hand, she says, well, we're going to have another president in 2016. Well, if you're always looking at what you're going to have, you're never going to do. Well, exactly. You know, I mean. I'm not going to wash my car today because it's going to rain Friday. <laughs> well, you know. That's the way it always happens. You wash your car, then it rains. Okay, just get used to it. <laughs> I, know, I know, I know. It's a bad example, but but, but that's just seriously. you know seriously that that's just an example of. That is an example of you know always looking and you know and it's and it's another thing about you know about fear mongering. Oh, this could happen. The sky is falling. The sky is falling. Um, so we can't do that. But if we're if you're not progressive on the issues and push the envelope, then we'll we'll remain stagnant as a country. Um, and so moving forward with this in Las Vegas and in Nevada um, uh, seems to be a very, a very smart, uh, a very smart thing to do. Well, we so, are stagnant, you know, and as long as we continue to live in the 19th century, those of us growing in the 21st will have no option for our future. But we'll have more from Florida and the region after the break. All right. Do you need help getting your Nevada medical marijuana card? Dr. Reefer is now accepting new patients. There are no medical records required we have of doctor on staff to give you a thorough physical examination. There is a 99% approval rate for patients. They also have a money back guarantee. If you don't qualify, you don't pay. Free consultation is available. Call 702-428-0000. 702-428-0000. To get your Nevada medical marijuana card today. Locally owned and operated TSI Total Safety Incorporated has kept our community safe since 1998. We provide superior services offering professional installation, local fire and burglar alarm monitoring, and the fastest response times in Las Vegas. We also offer armed and unarmed security, video security systems, access control, and fire safety installation and service. All of your security needs are covered. Call us at 702-967-0000 that's 702-967-0000 or visit us at tsivegas.com. 
WeCan 702 is a Nevada cannabis community. We are a 501c3 nonprofit that meets in Southern Nevada. We are a social group that started in Las Vegas for patient support. We've been active in the community for over five years. If you'd like to join us on any of our events or parties, please contact us through Facebook at WeCan702 on Meetup at www.meetup.com forward slash WeCan702. Our website is www.wecan702.org. Be a part of the Nevada Cannabis Reform Revolution. Please join us and donate today. Hi, welcome back, everybody. Uh, our Today's 420 moment is Susan Sarandon. Uh, Susan Sarandon highly supports medical marijuana and legalization, and she's never really shy to discuss her marijuana use in support of reform. She's a 67-year-old actress, and she's currently um, starring in the movie Tammy. Um, and here's a quote from uh, Susan on New York's recently decriminalization effort. It got decriminalized in small amounts. It will be legal everywhere, and that will cause uh, a very interesting tipping point. Certainly, if more people were smoking instead of drinking, people don't get mean on weed, don't beat up their wives on weed, and don't drive crazy on weed. They just get hungry. They don't go out of the house, and they laugh a lot. I think it would be make for a much more gentle world. Um, she also commented on the controversy surrounding edibles. Well, it needs to be treated as a controlled substance in that you don't give it to kids and that you don't drive. Certainly, liquor has caused more deaths. There's never been a death by marijuana, and the money spent to incarcerate people and the money spent on drugs war, uh, war and in fact, the drug cartels are running wild. It's crazy. Susan Sarandon was born October 4th. 1946 is she's an american actress she's won an academy award for best actress in her uh, performance in the 1995 dead man walking and a bafta award for the best actress in the 1994 film the client she began her career in 1970 in a film called joe and appeared in a soap opera a world apart from 1970 to 1971 She's noted for her active support in progressive and left liberal politic uh, causes. In 1999, she was appointed the UNICEF Goodwill Ambassador. During the 2000 election, Susan Sarandon reported Ralph Nader's run for president, supported Ralph Nader's uh, run for president, serving as a co-chair of the National Steering Committee for Nader in 2000. During the 2004 election campaign, she withheld support for Nader's bid being among the several Nader Raiders who urged Nader to drop out and his voters offered their support to the Democratic Party candidate John Kerry. After the 2004 election, Sarandon called for all U.S. elections to be monitored by international entities. So she's not only a humanitarian. Uh, in 2006, she received uh, a Humanitarian Action uh, Against Hunger Humanitarian Award, and she was honored with her work for UNICEF a as a Goodwill Ambassador and an advocate for victims of hunger and HIV and AIDS. Uh, she's also a spokesperson for Heifer International. So she's not only <laughs> a pro-cannabis um, actress, but she supports several really, really good causes. So here's our 420 moment to you, Susan Sarandon. And that's it. <laughs> Fantastic, you know. And uh, she's been as she's been an advocate for other states. We're just adding more and more states to the list that are um, trying to legalize cannabis. We have uh, in a little over three months, voters in Alaska, Oregon, and Washington, Oregon, Oregon. I go through that every week. Or in, in D.C. Uh, will vote to legalize cannabis. Well, what's interesting is um, Alaska will take up ballot measure two, which is similar to Colorado's Amendment 64. It would uh, legalize possession, use, and state license distri distribution of cannabis and would do so as a constitutional amendment. You know, our, our secretary of our uh, nonprofit is up in Alaska right now for 10 days with uh, the head of the, um, well, Joe Bresney. He, he's the regional director for what, NCIA? I, I believe so, yes. 
So, well, Perry's up there for about 10 days, and uh, and we wish him luck up there with, with, all their, with all their political doings, for sure. Certainly, they could use all the help. Um, um, with respect to D.C., their cannabis initiative legalized has had more than twice the required amount of signatures. Uh, the district has yet to officially certify the initiative, though they're expected to do so soon. That initiative would legalize the possession and use of up to an ounce of cannabis, going a step further than the district's uh, recently enacted law, making possession of an ounce a simple $25 ticket. That's it, 25 bucks. But Oregon, <laughs> Oregon is where it's at. Oregon is where it's at. I've, I've uh, had friends that lived in Oregon for years, and uh, they, they would always, always tell me about how very liberal it was with their cannabis laws uh, and, and growing out, you know, in fields of green. Fields of green. Well, their initiative, led by a new approach, Oregon, 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 Oregon. <laughs> would, I swear, I get you know, you know that one word you get stuck on. Uh -huh. uh, would take things a step further and would legalize possession, use, and sale of up to half a pound of cannabis, eight ounces. Ooh, that's Al a lot. Although one could rightfully argue that the limit should be even higher or removed entirely, there's no limit on how much tobacco you can possess. For example, what? You mean you can grow your own tobacco in Oregon and 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 roll your own cigarettes and stuff? I mean, why would? Of course, you have people that wouldn't do anything, but but eight ounces is a massive difference in comparison to a single ounce. Oregon's initiative legalizes the private cultivation of up to four plants, allows retail outlets, and the tax structure is far more reasonable than the markets in Washington in Colorado. For example, cannabis would likely be around a hundred and forty dollars an ounce. That's really good, considering you know how I went into Colorado shops and just got basically from even, yeah three hundred and fifty to seven hundred dollars for an ounce, a hundred and forty dollars. <laughs> That's a lot. That's a lot. That is a big difference. Yeah, that is a lot of difference. And I wish them all the success. You know, much like us here, I'm, I'm looking forward to the 140 and less an ounce. You know, I am too, but I just, I, I'm having trouble visualizing that right now with the number of, the number of applications that are going in in cultivation and, and the amount of money that it's going to take to get these applications through. The cost inevitably is going to be passed on to the patient. So do you think that really we're going to come out of the gate with 140 an ounce? No, I, I believe we're going to come out the gate at four, if not a little higher an ounce. About you know, 400 an ounce? Yeah, about, but, you know, I, I believe, I hope, after, mm -hmm. after three, six months, you know, we drop down to real prices. Otherwise, it's going to leave the patients to where they have been before going to their friendly neighborhood street pharmacist and we don't want that well either that or continuing to grow on their own i mean uh i for one do not make two hundred thousand dollars a year nowhere near that and shut the front door you don't no you know all these things that i do uh as a weekend president and on the radio show well i volunteer I volunteer. So, no, all these things that you see me at and everything else, people think I'm banking the cash. Uh -uh, it ain't happening. I have just one job. Isn't it hilarious how people come up to you thinking you're rolling in the dough because you work as we can and you run your weekend? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Not only that, they not only do they think I'm rolling in the dough, they, they assume all sorts of other things about me that are just untrue. And, and I'm like, you know what? I am too focused on the issue of cannabis and giving safe access to people to then to sit here and argue with you because it would take me all day to argue my detractors. And I'd really just have better things to focus on. Like making sure patients still have access to grow, safe access to their medications. I mean, a whole host of issues that we as patients and stakeholders need to address by 
getting up off our derriers and getting involved. That's, that's true, you know, and I was just I was just told, uh, I, I suggested in the state legislative meeting that that we have um, the application, you have you pay the $25 for the application and um, and then and then you can download the application on the download the application on the <laughs> website um, that's my phone that is and you then you pay the $75 on the other end to to get the application completed and i was just told by people oh you don't care about the patients because that 25 dollars that they're paying they might never use the they might never use the application well guess what it's in the law that they have to pay the 25 and then the 75 so instead of accusing me of not being for the patients why don't you read the law it says that there is two payments that need to be it, it needs to be broken up and they were reduced this past april yeah they were reduced in part to an effort by we can by everybody at we can and there was there were a lot of people involved going up to carson city there were a lot of people involved in these meetings and those people, you know, these those people that helped with this and in reading the law know that know that there is there is two fees that you need to pay. So the twenty five and then the seventy five. But you know, so in me saying, hey, the, why don't you pay the twenty five and the application being available online? I was accused of not caring for the patients because many patients will download the application and then not be able to get the other seventy five together. And I'm like, you need to stop. And leave me alone. I'm not going to accuse you of not caring for the patients, but I will accuse you of not turning off your phone. <laughs> Over oh! 2.4 million in <laughs> cannabis sold and 615000 in taxes is what the take was. In the first three weeks of legal sales in Washington, on top of the shortage and Main Street closing their doors rather than selling crappy cannabis you know what and i have to applaud somebody for not selling inferior product uh in, in instead of just making a buck you know that that's really ethics right there the exact number in excise tax for the state was six hundred fourteen thousand nine hundred eighty five dollars it doesn't include local and state sales tax, which comes to an additional $240,000. So you're talking almost uh, well, um, about three quarters of a million dollars in taxes in the first three weeks. Wow, that's a lot of bread. That's oh. a lot for first responders, for education, you know, but ooh, exactly. we don't want to legalize cannabis. We'll just sell uh, gallons and gallons of alcohol. Well, no, we'll just leave it to the uh, street pharmacist to sell the cannabis and, and we'll get all the money on revenues from locking them up and seizing their stuff. Um Seattle, so more for Washington News. Seattle, 80% of tickets for public cannabis consumption are given by one officer. The officer is then put on leave. A new report released from Seattle Police Department has found that 83 tickets given out for public consumption of cannabis this year, 80% um, of those were distributed by one officer. The officer has been since been put on administrative leave and is being uh, reassigned. Yeah, he needs to be a desk jockey. Um, in Seattle, state possession and use of a licensed distri uh, distribution of cannabis is legal. However, public consumption of cannabis is illegal. Um, though in Seattle, it's a simple $27 ticket. So this guy has been walking around writing $27 tickets. What a jerk. Anyway, 83 of these tickets were handed out in Seattle. And they were given disproportionately to minorities and the homeless. Well, the homeless are home. I just want to correct you. You do? On your story. Don't do that. 66 of the 83 were given by one person, not 83 of the 83. No, 83 tickets, 80% 80 of those tickets. Yeah. And that reading. would be 60 66. 66 of, of the 83, 83 were given by one officer. <laughs> and they were also handed out to minorities. Um,. The officer has been reported to you, the Office of Professional Accounting and been put on leave while investigation takes place on this matter. So, 
Goodbye. I'm just curious. What did he do? Did he walk around and did he smell it? Did he see somebody? What prompted him to write 66 $27 tickets. Is there a contest for the most tickets at that department? <laughs> I'm not really sure. But speaking of contest, uh, the first person to call in, 702-731-1230, is going to get two HempFest tickets. So give us a call. Our number uh, is one 800 or no, one eight six six eight two zero five five two eight. Or if you're local, 702-731-1230. And the lines are open. The first caller gets these HempFest tickets. Woohoo, HempFest. U.S. Research is stoned driving. Really? The National Institute on Drug Abuse is a U.S. federal government research agency. It supports extensive studies on the effects of drug use abuse and addiction fearing that legalized marijuana will lead to stone drivers wrecking havoc on the roadways the agency recently conducted a third study sturdy to measure the effects of alcohol and marijuana on motorists behind the wheel alcohol and marijuana so well that'll give us a good contrast um to go by all right i think we have found our winner we got our winner on the line. Hi. Hi. Hey, who's calling? This is Stephanie. Stephanie, congratulations. You are Thank the you. winner of these Hempfest tickets. That's awesome. That's great. So we're going to take your your um, name and your phone number off the air. So we don't want people calling you going, hey, take me. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> and thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Yes, Hemp Fest is coming up. You want to make sure you listen in when we have these little events on and off the air, whether we have them at our patients' meetings, at our social gatherings, you never know. That's why it's a great idea to get involved with Weekend. You can go to weekend702.org or you can go to the Weekend 702 Facebook and like us and follow us and get all the information there. Sure. So you guys follow us and um, come to our meetings and we'll have more Hemp Fest tickets until October 4th when the great event is going on. Now we're going to move to Wichita, Kansas. Enough signatures have been submitted to put cannabis decriminalization to a vote in Wichita, Kansas. At 420 p.m. on July 24th, the group Kansas for Change submitted over twice the required amount of signatures needed to put their cannabis decriminalization initiative to a vote this November. The group was required to collect 3,000 signatures um, from registered Wichita voters. The city has now six days to verify these signatures and... Uh, there's the full text on the petition basically says that they the code uh, the municipal code should be amended to remove all criminal penalties for possession of one ounce or less on cannabis uh, or marijuana for adult personal use or medical use in possession of paraphernalia and that a maximum civil fine of $25 shall be implemented for possession of cannabis and marijuana um, and the possession of paraphernalia for adults. Under the current Kansas law, the possession of any amount of cannabis is a misdemeanor with a potential year-long prison sentence. Subsequent charges are, are mandatory 10 months with a um, potential sentence of up to 3.5 years. Wichita is the largest city in Kansas and the 49th largest city in the United States. And so, yay, Kansas. Yay, Kansas. We are on our way to getting 33 states. I think we will have the 33 states by the time we get to the 2016 presidential election. You know, there's also something that happened uh, in Michigan that's really that really just has piqued my interest. That um, Michigan uh, Michigan Senate committee approves bill to legalize cannabis dispensaries and edibles and extracts, um, but. The Michigan State Gov uh, Senate Government Operations Committee has given the approval to two cannabis-related measures, House Bill 4271 and House Bill 5104. Both measures have been approved by the state's House of Representatives, and now they're up for full Senate vote under, um, under current Michigan law. 
the possession of up to two and a half ounces of cannabis um, and the cultivation of up to 12 plants is legal for qualifying patients, although dispensaries are not permitted under the state's law. House Bill 5104 would legalize cannabis extracts and cannabis-infused products such as brownies and teas, allowing them to be possessed and used by patients and be sold at the dispensaries that House Bill 4271 would legalize. Senate Majority Leader Randy Richardville tells, uh, tells the reporter that most both bills could be voted on as early as next month. Um, the other... I was going to say the other happy news that I actually was talking about more than that was that is that um, is actually in Minnesota and not Michigan. Minnesota, Minnesota has passed. No, that's not the one I was looking for. Minnesota now requires a criminal conviction before people uh, can lose their property. To forfeiture, you know this is the one of the biggest. Um, this is one of the biggest money making uh, opportunities, I guess, for cops and all uh, you know law enforcement is to steal your stuff and resell it. Are you guys aware of that? They can take your stuff from you and say that you um, that you were doing something illegal, and under that law, they can sell your stuff. I got an idea. How about you get the particulars of that? We'll get back to that and happy health news after the break. Okay. They said it would never happen. They were wrong. Las Vegas Hemp Fest is here. October 4th. All ages with live performances by Burner. I party like a rock star. Let the Benz fish tail all out the window. I got it off a fish scale. Cypress Hill Send Dog. Nappy Roots. Marlon Asher, also playing New Kingston. Potluck, a surprise performance from the LBC. And 25 more rap and reggae artists, speakers, and comics. Tickets available at Painless Wayne's Tattoo Shop and at the Las Vegas Hemp Fest.com. October 4th, the Las Vegas Hemp Fest. Brought to you by Dr. Reefer. Are you looking for a new career? For the next 20 years, 10,000 people per day in America will be turning 65. They're going to need somebody to take care of them. If you're interested in a career in home care or assisted living care, log on to ProCaregivers.com to find out how you can have a well-paying and secure job in this growing industry. The need for caregivers is so urgent that some classes are subsidized by the state, so you may not pay anything. ProCaregivers.com is certified by the state of Nevada and other states for post-secondary education training certification and can help place you in a job once your training is complete. Log on to ProCaregivers.com for more information today. The Von Dank Group offers turnkey solutions for all your cannabis needs, bringing transparency and responsibility to a young budding industry. Helping patients by producing the cleanest, safest, and most potent medicines and infusibles possible. The Von Dank Group is a design, management, and consulting corporation with over 30 years of industry experience and knowledge of the dispensary, edibles, infusible kitchen, and large-scale cultivation of cannabis manufacturing facilities. Let the Von Dank Group help you grow your cannabis business from seed to green. www.vondank.com Welcome back, everybody. This is Jennifer Solis, and I have Raymond Fletcher and Beach in the house uh, at 1230 KLAV AM. And the story that I was talking about before we left had to do with um, Minnesota. Minnesota now requires a criminal conviction before people can lose their property to foreclosure. You mean I rather mean, the forfeiture, not foreclosure. Rather than just being arrested and charged by the thugs, I mean the police? Yeah, actually, this was a huge win for property rights and due process. Um, the governor in Minnesota, Mark Dayton, signed a bill yesterday to curb the abuse and little-known police practice called civil forfeiture. Unlike criminal forfeiture, under civil forfeiture, someone does not have to be convicted of a crime or even charged with one to permanently lose their cash, their car, their home. 
So um, the SF874, the, the bill, corrects the injustice of civil forfeiture. Now the government can only take the property if it obtains a criminal conviction or its equivalent like the property owner pleads guilty to a crime or if the property owner becomes an informant. The bill also shifts the burden of proof onto the government where it rightfully belongs. So they have to prove that you've done something and convict you before they can sell your stuff. Before they could just take your stuff and then you would have to go fight them in court to get it back. Now see, this is how this works. They take your stuff and they don't file on you. And you go to get your stuff back, and then they go, oh, guess what? We lost it. We're filing on you now. We're going to go into court over this. And so too many people got scared of going in and saying, you know what? You guys illegally seized this. This is, you know, this is not fair. Now the burden of proof is on the government. They have to convict you or turn you into a narc before they can rightfully keep your stuff. You would think that once they violate your property, that they would have something like up to 72 hours to either to charge or return. It should be. Well, they have, I think they have up to a year. If they arrest you for something, they have up to a year to file Boo. charges, the district attorney. And so people, and then it, it's like right after, um, Right after you you won't be able to get your stuff back anymore. If they don't file on you, then you're not going to get your stuff back. But if you do fight to get your stuff back, then they can file on you. Because I think it's like something like seven or eight months so that you can get your stuff back. Boo. Yeah, bad law. Okay, Jerry, Jerry, <laughs> waiting for the man. Jerry Browner, Jerry Browner, Jerry Brown is the decider on California's medical marijuana industry. For the first time, the state's law enforcement lobby has agreed that marijuana is a business worth regulating as opposed to a scrounge deserving extermination. Uh, police chiefs and the powerful League of California Cities uh, met basically to uh, present a cohesive front uh, which you would consider bizarre, <laughs> you know, to say the least. You got the chiefs of the police in the League of the Cities saying, hey, we changed our mind on marijuana. But well, but it, but it's good. You know, it, 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 a plan to put the state's medical marijuana industry under the control of the Department of Consumer Affairs, which would, li which would issue license for a fee and conduct inspections while letting cities and counties deal with issues like zonings and allow them to decide even if they want the pot shops. So it sounds kind of like what they're doing here is what they're getting around to finally doing in California. Is Yeah, exactly. So actually that's why we've been called the most progressive state as, as it pertains to medical cannabis because we crafted the law or helped craft the law. Everybody, you know, with that was involved, helped craft the law so that, uh, so that it would make sense for everybody. Um, how it happened in California is the municipalities kind of, uh, wrote all their own type of law and there was no unifying, uh, there was no unifying law at the, at the head. They're all losing money. They're all losing money. Who's losing, losing the, money? Right? The municipalities. That's what they look to cannabis as, as their, their gold rush, their green rush, their, their, their oil revenue. Oh, and so Either, you're saying in them shutting stuff down that they're losing, they're losing that revenue, that tax revenue, it, and stuff it, like that. No, and the, and the way that they're transitioning from the way that they first operated to the way that they're operating now is the way that Nevada is beginning their operations, which is, you That's know. That's true. You know, they're licensing and stuff. They're doing how many years after the fact, whereas we started with our business licensing and whatnot. First, yeah, exactly. Um, so um, more from the nation, the New York Times. Times, they are a change in folks. The New York Times, the largest and most widely read newspaper in the United States, recently launched a six-part series calling for the federal government to decriminalize the sale and use of marijuana. Uh, the sale or use of marijuana, also known as cannabis, has been prohibited 
is prohibited as a crime by the federal government since 1937. The Times editorial board characterized the continued prohibition of this substance um, in which many individuals use to control symptoms of certain health disorders in addition to pain management as being harmful to society as a whole. Uh, I actually absolutely agree. Um, for more than 70 years, federal prohibition of marijuana acknowledged that many sectors of society continue to use it and continue to have uh, concerns about the effects on health. And they called it social costs. Um, the only social cost that I really see from this is the, is the jailing of people that are just smoking a plant. So the New York Times reported that almost three times the arrest for marijuana possession in the 2012 compared with cocaine and heroin combined. Most of those arrested and jailed for marijuana possession wind up being young African-American citizens who then become career criminals due to having an early prison record. Yeah, yeah that's absolutely right because when you're a young and impressionable youth, and we're not talking about these kids getting busted like 20, 25 years old. You're talking about kids kids they have access to it like 15 16 17 years old well what my issue is is that they is that the new york police used to have a used to have a um a policy in place called stop and frisk and they only ask young african-american men to stop and frisk and empty your pockets they go up on wall street and ask some of those freaking new york bankers to to empty their pockets and let's see how much cocaine falls out let's see how much pot they're smoking but you know what they target minorities and they target and they target um people of color because you know they're racist pigs you're absolutely right and, and not only that you you target a segment of society that has uh been victim to to administrative abuses for decades you know who who, who are they going to believe you know are you go with the status quo or you know go with it's go with what your buddies tell you to do yeah it's sad and, and and that's the thing you know if one of the reasons that they will not decriminalize marijuana in my opinion is because of the amount of money that it makes the justice system well, now with um, this law in Minnesota or Michigan saying that you have to prove that they've actually done something, they, these are steps in the right direction from asset seizure and asset forfeiture. Um, we're trying to move away from, you know, robbing people, robbing people of their lives, their livelihood, Are their possessions. American civil liberties, much like that story you talked about a few weeks ago. What was that in Maryland? where the scent of cannabis alone cannot be a reason for an officer to stop and search you. Yep, so times they are a-changing. All right, next up, there's surprising health benefits of medical marijuana. Uh, we all knew this. The drug that's legal now in more than 22 states um, has their finding surprising health benefits. Well, duh. Um, they prevent disease if you have the right formulation and dosing. The dried flower buds from the cannabis plant contain over 500 can compounds. Some are thought to um, some are thought to fight cancer. Um, other have powerful healing effects and can be used for medicinal purposes. Well, the no, no. they've also proven that if you smoke cannabis, it prevents head, neck, and throat cancer. They did a 22-year study on the fact uh, that people that smoked cannabis versus the people that smoked cigarettes. What they found was that it prevented head, neck, and throat cancer. And so... Well, not only that, it, it, it's viable treatment for movement disorders, nausea, glaucoma, lack of appetite, anxiety, chronic pain, so on and so forth. So the government just needs to get off their backside and legalize and let us patients and doctors and everyone have access to research. Well, they've, they've already put patents out on it, so you may might as well just legalize it. So, the, I mean, that's my two cents anyway. So uh, we have a global story from Spain. Uh, I don't think we're gonna we're gonna run out of time before we get to this one. So we'll hold on to it next week. We have our patients meeting coming up Saturday at two. Is it? It's Saturday at two at the Coffee Bean and Tea Leaf, and we also have a pool party coming up in later in August. So until then, keep happy and keep healthy.